Good afternoon and welcome to today's conference at the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Talia Dekel. Tomorrow evening, the Jewish people will gather to tell the story of their liberty from Egyptian slavery. This while over 130 Israelis, civilians and soldiers, ranging from children to the elderly, remain in captivity in Gaza, their conditions unknown. On Tuesday, the second day of Passover, we will mark 200 days to the events of October 7th. Joining us today is Rachel Goldberg Poland, mother of 23-year-old Hirsch, who was kidnapped from the Nova Festival after being severely wounded in the Hamas onslaught of the South. Rachel has been an advocate for the release of all hostages since the very first day of the war, and we are honored to have her here at this continuously difficult time. Rachel, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, we actually last spoke on day 54, and according to your sticker, this is now triple that time. Um, when, when you began this journey, did you imagine how long it would possibly last? No, and the truth is that I still feel like I'm trapped in October 7th, which is a phenomenon that um, all of us hostage families seem to be feeling. Um, you know, I often say we all live on a different planet now and time is, is very much something that doesn't make sense to us. Um, but I never considered anything. I mean, I'm, you know, we're all in this slow motion, ambiguous trauma that continues to unfold. And so we're not in the same dimension of experience as, as people who are sort of in a normal range of life. Right, it's, it's essentially a parallel parallel universe happening together. Um, how will you and your family be marking Passover, if at all? So we are, um, we're going to be going to dear friends who are like family, and we're also going to be with um, some of our family, some uh, close cousins who, um, who are very, um, wow. they're all very sensitive thoughtful, kind, um, also going through this with us, uh, they're all very close to Hirsch. And so we are going to be doing a Seder uh, in a way that um, the truth is Rabbi Nachman from Braslav says that the Seder is really a time to be shouting out to God, that it's really a prayer service. It's not a meal. Um, that uh, it's sort of evolved into that over time. But really, this is a prayer service. We start with, uh, you know, telling the beginning of the story of the Jewish people at their lowest point. And by the end of the Seder, we're begging and screaming out for an end to the suffering and for Eliyahu Hanavi, for Elijah the prophet to enter and to escort in the idea of the Messiah, the idea of a time when there will be no more suffering and no more war. Um, and so the all of the symbolic things that we do at the Seder will take on a much more profound and deep meaning this year, the bread of affliction, the bitter herbs, the salt water that represents the tears of the Jewish people when they were in captivity, in slavery. So we'll be doing that with these, you know, this close close uh, group of friends and and they have been very clear that if 15 minutes in, if an hour in, we just can't do it. Or if we're all needing to cry, we will all cry. So I think it will be a Seder um, and an existential form of therapy in certain ways. Well, thank you. Thank you for the very honest answer. Um, you know, in our in our in our story of Passover, we had Moses. We had uh, this one individual who was responsible for for ask, asking uh, Pharaoh to let our people go. Um, do you think that such a character exists these days? And you know, in the reality that we're living, is is Moses a collection of people? Um, and what what expectations do you have for this for this character if he did exist? Wow, it's a really insightful question. Um... I don't know if maybe Moses is a composite of a few different people that have influence on the few people that have power to make decisions. 
in this particular case, I do think that something that we need all of our leaders to be doing, all of them, is to make the decision to care about and love their own people more than they hate their enemies and to let their own people go rather than asking someone else to let specific people go. I think we all have to decide to let our own people go. And that requires people to make a conscious, difficult, brave decision to care about their own people more than they hate their enemies. Have you heard anything in the last few days about, you know, developments towards a hostage deal? Are you concerned about any developments that we've heard? Uh, I think even this morning we heard that uh, that the Qataris are are uh, are skeptical that Hamas will continue to control Gaza, and this really is our, you know, our only negotiating partner right now. The truth is that one of the things that I've learned in this crash course of geopolitics and military strategy and media acumen is that um, never to really take the news at face value. I wouldn't even say to take it with a grain of salt. I would say to take it with a pail of salt. Um, there've been so many examples of when something is shared in the media and then it's absolutely not accurate that I very rarely read anything. Um, I definitely don't watch the news. So um, I am not, you know, the best person to ask about uh, latest developments. Um, and I would just remain optimistic and hopeful and doing all the work that we do, trying to talk to every single person that we can talk to who's a person in power or with influence or even people who are not in power and who have influence because we don't know who is gonna be the vessel, who is gonna be the vehicle, where is the key that's going to unlock this quagmire of misery and angst and trauma that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are experiencing right now because of this. I understand. Um, we did have one question that came in with regards to, to everything that's happened vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran over the last couple of weeks. And if you or your, you know, the other people who you're helping uh, have felt in any way, not necessarily sidelined, but has the issue, has your personal issue been, um, you know, has lost attention in, in the wake of this, uh, this, this uh, war with Iran over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, every, every couple of days we hear something new about Isra Israel's response, Iran's response, and it, this has influenced in any way the conversations that you're having in trying to push forward and ensure that the issue of the hostages remains on the, both the national agenda, but also on the international agenda. I think certainly without a doubt, um, the Iranian attack between Saturday night and Sunday morning here made a humongous impact in terms of where the focus was um, and now continues sort of this trajectory to worry about the larger picture in the region. Um, I think that makes sense. Obviously, as the mother of a hostage, I'm not happy about it, but I understand that you know, so many different countries and, and world uh, world leaders are focused on how can we de-escalate the situation in this entire region so that we don't lead to World War III. I understand that, you know, naturally people are not going to be having necessarily, uh, you know, the 133 hostages as the top story. Um, I will... Um, just say one thing about, you know, in the introduction, when you were talking about the 133, I think it's incredibly important and very often inaccurately reported that these 133 are Israelis. These 133 are from 25 different nations. There are uh, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims who are being held. And I think that it is really critical that 
that in reporting about this situation that it is reported accurately because otherwise this does become a very specific monolithic homogenous group of people, which it's not. Um, and so I do, while I understand that, you know, certainly while the attack was going on and for the few days afterwards with the decision of Israel to retaliate, how to retaliate, what are we going to do? What are they going to do? But I think that now that ship has sailed. I think for the moment, you know, everybody's gotten their last licks in. Um, and now we can pivot to these people. And I would say that there are so many stressful, heated issues that are that are being discussed now in this entire region. And there is one panacea that would deflate and release the pressure in all areas. And that is to let these 133 people, these cherished souls be released after almost 200 days in captivity. And, you know, we understand that there is a deal that was on the table that for the first time, not just the US and Israel, but Qatar and Egypt were giving their blessing to and saying, this is a solid deal for Hamas. And it was going to be a very painful and very steep price for Israel, but Israel leaned in. And so now when we have voices all over the world saying, stop the suffering in Gaza, we agree with that. We meaning, you know, my family and certainly the hostage families, we want all the suffering in Gaza to stop, including the suffering of the 133 people who we all know intimately. Um, and this is an opportunity for other parties to say, we're going to actually stop the suffering of the Gazan innocent people who are really bearing the brunt of this, along with other innocent people who are currently living in Gaza, of which I know one of them very, very dearly and well. Um, one, one journalist is asking um, whether it's, well, she's, first she's stating that you don't see very many women involved, uh, at least at the forefront of the negotiations. Are you aware of women maybe involved behind the scenes and what your thoughts on that are in terms of the impact that might have on the process? Well, I've said, I've talked about that a lot in the past, that I think that if there was a mother in the room, any mother from any of the sides, I'm not, you know, it doesn't have to be a Jewish mother, a Christian mother, a Muslim mother. I mean, it, just any mother, any woman, any daughter, any sister, I, I think that it would be different because I think whenever you have a homogenous group of people together discussing any topic, you don't get the vibrancy of different um, worldviews. And I have suggested that all of the uh, people at the negotiating table send their mothers for a day. Um, and I think we'd have a very different outcome. Uh, and that's not to say that that the men in those rooms are not trying hard. I just think that when you have all of one type of people, you're not getting a full spectrum of ideas. Um, and I do know in um, I do know that behind the scenes there are some women. I don't really think that it's ideal that they're behind the scenes. I don't know why they have to be behind the scenes, but you know, I also don't think that people should be in a position just because they are different. I think you have to be qualified. I think you have to have legs, you know, um, and uh, experience and knowledge and wisdom. So um, I wouldn't have someone there just because they were a woman, just because they are a woman. Understood. And speaking of one of those women, uh, you were actually selected uh, to be one of Time Magazine's People of the Year, uh, which, which is quite a title, but under the circumstances, I'm sure uh, this was a difficult thing to accept. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think clearly I don't belong on that list personally. I think I was chosen as a representative of the entire hostage crisis. I think uh, I am grateful that time acknowledges that the hostage crisis is important enough to be a topic that should be discussed. And I think they simply said, we can't put a, you know 133 families in one little box on that list. So I think that they chose me as a symbol, as a representative of the 133. Um, and I pray that it will be a platform that gives more light and more advocacy to this horrendous, unacceptable, tragic, miserable situation that has gone on way too long. Uh, someone's asking about a follow-up question to that. Um, when you look at you know the, the larger group of you and the other 132 families, and even you know it extends to uh, the families of those who were kidnapped and returned since since this whole thing started, do you feel that there is um, that there is solidarity uh, among the group? Are are they united more or less um, as we as we approach this holiday? Well, I think we certainly all feel a kindred spirit of pain. Um, we all know each other's uh, experience, which is such an indescribable experience that at least when I am standing with another hostage family, I, I don't feel like I need to say a word. I know they are feeling exactly what I'm feeling. Um, and so in that sense, I think we have this, this bond that we will always have. Um, and if we agree on everything, I mean, I would say, you know, there's that old adage, you know, two Jews, three opinions. Well, you have 133 human beings and all of their extended families I'm sure there are many different opinions, but our our united feeling is these human beings need to be home. They are not part of the larger geopolitical situation that is going on. They are being used as pawns. We are being used as pawns. A lot of it is this is theater, and we are the unwitting characters and extras in this theater, and it is absolutely unfathomable that the world is allowing this to continue. And how are you finding the response uh, fr from those that you are meeting with, that you continue to meet with, who do have influence? Do you feel like they're just giving you lip service or do you think that they are you know, really listening to what you're saying and trying to get things done? I think it, it sort of depends on who we talk to, but I mean, unanimously, at least my experience, is when I'm speaking to anyone, they can't help but feel a human connection. And when they're saying they really want the hostages returned, I think, of course they do. Who doesn't want the hostages returned? I mean, you know, who's who's sort of reasonable? Um, but are you doing anything? Because wanting and doing are two very different verbs. And I learned that early on that that yes, giving me a hug is lovely. And yes, saying you want them back is very kind, but what are you doing? And doing and saying are very different things. My mother used to say that to me, you can say whatever you want, but it's what you do. You are what you do. Right. Um, if we can just use the last couple of minutes uh, that we have together to talk a little bit about Hirsch as a person, um, if you can remind our listeners a little bit about him, you know his characteristics, what you miss most about him. Sure, uh, Hirsch is, first of all, he's my eldest, he's my only son. He just turned 23 on October 3rd. He was at the Nova Music Festival with one of his best friends, Anar Shapira, celebrating his birthday. Um, he is a laid back, happy-go-lucky, funny with a dry, dark sense of humor guy. He is 
a citizen of the world. He's curious about everything. He, from a young age, was obsessed with geography. He knows every single country and its capital. He knows every single country's flag. He knows populations, highest elevations. He's had um, a real obsession. He got a subscription to National Geographic magazine when he was in first grade and has read it like a book religiously every time a, a new a new one comes out. And he is wild about soccer. He loves music festivals and travel. And uh, he has very little ego, which is a really nice quality in someone. He asks questions and really leaves room for you to think and answer. And, um, you know, there's there's not really anything that I don't miss about him. Thank you for that. Uh, is there anything that you want to leave us with, perhaps, as we, you know, embark on our own seders, every one of us, uh, as we sit down with our families, something that you'd like us to think about? I mean, I think that there, there are so many messages that throughout the seder, people will be thinking about um, the hostages. And I think when we ask the four questions, you know, the fifth question really has to be, why is everyone not out yet? And um, and the sixth question can be, what am I gonna do about it? And people can keep coming up with seven, eight, nine, ten, a 10, 100 questions. Um, you know, we talk about the four sons who we try to address at the Seder. And we, we say, it's not really four sons, it's four personality types. You know, there are curious people, contrary people, uh, sort of shy people and people who are passive. And what we need to wonder is which category does our loved one fall into and why aren't they with us? And when we say during the Seder, you know, next year, may we be free people. In the past, we maybe have said to ourselves, you know, what does that really mean? And this year more than ever before, I think in our lifetimes, certainly uh, we will be really saying next year, may, may we all be free people with our families being together. Dianu, it's enough, it's enough. And let us be privileged to be together with our loved ones again soon. Diana, indeed. Uh, Rachel Goldberg Pollen, thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for being with us. I won't wish you a Chag Sameach, but I will wish you a Passover that's uh, fulfilled in its context as the holiday of freedom for Hirsch and, of course, for the rest of the hostages. Amen. May we have a miracle. And you never know, they could be home tomorrow. Amen, amen. And thank you also to my colleagues, Jonathan Beck and Ali Naol for facilitating this call. I'll just add that JPC will be virtually operating throughout the holiday period. So feel free to reach out and our staff members will be happy to assist. Thank you again, Rachel. And thank you to everyone who joined. Thank you.